Well, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Justin Eisen. I am a senior software engineer at Apple Tools. Um, for those of you that don't know what Apple Tools is, our booth is right out of here. We specialize in visual testing. And a uh, little bit of background about myself. I've been in IT about 20 years now. The first 10 years were um, manual, manual tester. And then the last 10 have been uh, development, automation, and so forth. Um, another bit of history is I too was at, was at the 2012 Selenium conference where I saw Dan's awesome uh, prototype that he built and I was amazed because at the time I was using UI test, those of you that remember uh, iOS's automation framework years ago, which was not the best. And I was also doing Robotium for um, Java, or for Android, so that actually um, having two separate frameworks was quite a frustration, and then plus Selenium for web. So now we're all here because of Dan and Jonathan Lips and <coughs> Jason Huggins. So it was a great achievement that now we have Appium. So today I'm going to talk about using Appium to build this native app crawler that I did and how I did it and show you the uh, pros of using something simple. So the topics of my talk will be talking about uh, today's quick development landscape, especially with Agile, uh, mobile, the mobile test matrix, and all the near impossible uh, combinations that we should validate before we release, and showing how we can leverage uh, machines to do some of the work that we are having to pick up and do manually just because of all the work that needs to be done, and how the crawler could potentially uncover more bugs to help you, you know, find localization issues and performance problems, et cetera. So the agile world moves fast, and it's up to us to keep up. I put this video in here because this is how I felt. This is, I was this guy in the middle here running away from the bugs as fast as possible. And those were the developers on the top right laughing at me as they were introducing new bugs, trying to torment me. So especially with like CI and CD, you know, the time to market is becoming increasingly shorter. Companies want to push out new features to keep ahead of competition. They want to push out new bug fixes. They want to keep their app fresh. They want to take advantage of new um, operating system features or even uh, uh, features introduced into the hardware. And because of this, we're having less and less time to test these applications for all the things that we need to do. Uh, and it's putting more pressure on us. A lot of companies are relying on the end users to report bugs. You know, I see it all the time. I feel like we're almost desensitized by it. It's almost expected that, oh, the user, you know, hopefully a user will find whatever bugs there are and report it to us and we'll fix it. You know, I don't really agree with that approach, but that's sort of the way things are currently. So the goal, my goal at least, or what I was trying to do with this was you know, put the machines to work, automate the automation, and create something that I could collect as much metadata about my application on every single build to report back its findings. So essentially, like if I handed you the application, I said, here, go ahead, test my application. Tell me what you found, you know, what issues you found. Essentially trying to clone myself you know, because of the limited resources that I had at the time to give me back information about my app that I could check. So what is an application crawler? Those of you that are familiar with web, there's web crawlers out there, also known as spider or robots. Uh, basically, it's a program to mimic what a human would do, but at a software level, um, interacting with UI components. But before I begin, let me give you a little history about why I decided to do this. So I worked for a small startup at the time, and we were very big on dog fitting our application. Uh, those of you that don't know what that term is, it basically is test your own software. You know, you create the software, you test it internally. Um, but we had a problem. We also had um, a small QA team of two people that only had to do QA, but also test all the different applications we had. 
which was about six, iOS, Android, web, both desktop clients on Mac and Windows, and so forth. So it was a lot, a lot for limited resources to test everything. But we also tested internally, but some of the applications got more testing than others because some people preferred one platform versus the others. And our applications were constantly changing. <clears throat> we had some very, very, very talented designers and engineers and developers for our platforms. And just like any artist, I guess you would compare it to Will, they were never happy with what they did last. So they were constantly changing things, changing the UI or changing, tweaking things here and there. So I was finding myself constantly having to fix and revise tests due to these changes that our developers and designers were making. And I felt a lot like this guy. You know, those of you, those of you could probably empathize with me or sympathize. Uh, you know, you could spend an hour, two days, a week, months maybe, just implementing one single test because, you know, mobile automation isn't always so direct. You always are finding that workaround or you're doing research to solve a problem. It can take, take a long time. So after spending all that long time and patting yourself on the shoulder or back or whatever, and happy about yourself for only that implementation to break the next build. So this is how I felt. So about three years ago, around that time when I was feeling like that guy, I had this crazy idea. You know, how, what if I could just automate the automation? So let's go into the mobile test matrix and all the combinations that, you know, depending on if your application supports it and what we need to test. So orientations. It's not just landscape and portrait anymore. It's portrait this way, portrait, you know, 180, landscape this way, landscape uh, that way, depending on your application supports different orientations. But a lot of people tend to just test the uh, no portrait orientation because it makes sense this fits in your hand like this comfortably. But if your application supports both or all of these orientations, it should be tested. You know, things can happen like this when you rotate the screen. This was actually a, a, a true test that I was doing where I actually put the, the application into uh, landscape and the screen went blank. So if I had never tested this, we would have gone to production like this, and uh, potentially a customer would be the one emailing us, telling us there's an issue. There's many resolutions now, ton, tons of them, and there'll probably be 10 more tomorrow. And if you're not testing these resolutions that your application supports, you'll never know these issues exist. Um, you know, us as humans, you know, developers, designers, product people, we make lots of subconscious choices that we don't even know. And so you, a designer could potentially design something, not taking into account that their design might go on a very large um, mobile device. Whereas the, and the vice versa, it might go on a very small device and they don't realize it. So these things need to be found out. And bad things could happen, like this, where this application was put onto a uh, on a resolution, on a device that had a resolution that was way too big for it. So it was, should have never been able to be even installed. Operating versions, or sorry, operating system versions. You know, there's, what, 15 or so now, just Android alone. So if your application supports all these different operating systems, how are you gonna actually know unless you actually not verify it? Same goes for language. You know, if you have a multi-language app, a lot of people tend to just use, test in the language that they um, are familiar with. But how do you know it's gonna work for other languages, like German, for example. German strings are predominantly longer than English strings. So again, the designer, developer, whoever it is, made a subconscious decision and didn't account for different languages' string lengths. 
that could completely break your layout of your views. Uh, same goes for like languages such as Arabic and Hebrew, which the, they are from right to left, whereas Western languages are left to right. Again, designers, developers, or whoever it is may, 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 maybe have made subconscious decisions not accounting for those languages. So as you can see, just releasing a new version of an application, it's a, you know, it's a test overload. There's really so much to do and so little time to do it, especially if you're factoring in Agile and trying to push out these new releases as fast as possible. So you could possibly do this with UI automation. You know, create a test in JUnit, Loca, test in G, R spec, whatever it is that you your choice. But you would need literally an army of engineers to pull it off. Or if you have access to, you could hire an army of zombie testers. If you act now, you get a discount code. But automating every possible combination would be next to impossible to maintain. So if you did pull it off, any future updates to the application, you're potentially talking about thousands of lines of code. And God forbid there's a, a major rewrite, then pretty much all your automation is out the door. And then lastly, I want to talk about this topic is UI automation only tests what you program it to test. So any assertions that you have in your JUnit, R spec, or whatever it is, it's only explicitly going to test that. But the beauty with crawlers or monkey testers, they test the unexpected. They're going to test for things that you never programmed to do and hopefully find issues that you never anticipated. So now I'm getting into the part about building it. It just really couldn't be that hard. You know, my thought was, I'll just get, get all the UI elements that are apparently on my view and I'll just loop through them. You know, click, click in and look for some type of action to occur. But that was the easy part, but also really the core of any crawler. So we're going to go look at some examples now. So those of you may have seen this before. This is the hierarchy viewer in the Android um, SDK. There's other better ones now, like the Appium desktop app has a nice hierarchy viewer. This is doing the full hierarchy view. So you can see all the layers of the layouts of your just this one view alone. And you can see all the attributes of that object um, down um, beneath. And these are actually really good, valuable information to know, especially when you're building a crawler. Like, is it clickable? Is it enabled? Is it visible? It's, and especially the bounds and the accessibility label. Does it have an accessibility label? Does it have an ID? So there's a lot of information just in this object alone. So let's go ahead. Let's look at some elements now. Or let's programmatically look at form. Here, you doing a driver page source, gives me a dump of the XML, just like the hierarchy viewer displays in a nice, orderly fashion. There's also another method in the Ruby Appium lib called page, which essentially parses that information and gives you a nice printout. And I've used this for years to write my tests. You know, I just go into the console, I get all I type page, I get all the IDs or locators that are available um, in my application so I can write my tests at real time. But unfortunately, there's not a, enough information returned on this page method to do a, a proper crawl. So now we have the compressed hierarchy viewer. As you can see, this is a lot less information. And it's actually good because this is the only information that's relevant to the views that I actually need. This only is giving me the objects that I can visibly see on the UI. Again, gives me all the attributes that I need. So how do, how do we do that programmatically? So the awesome Appium devs implemented this new capability, or have this capability called ignore important views, which give you a compressed, um, give you this compressed hierarchy. So now this is great because now the crawler, I can use this uh, unimportant views or the compressed hierarchy to get just the objects that I need to interact with and not all the other um, fluff that was a part of the, the full one. 
Uh, here's just now, I'm taking, now I'm going to create some code to extend what Appium lib, lib the, the Ruby bindings, whatever, whatever I say Appium lib or Ruby lib, it's the Ruby bindings. I'm taking what they're giving me and I'm extending it to essentially extract all those, all the metadata or all, all the uh, attributes about the objects that you saw at the hierarchy viewer. Here I have highlighted where content description, if, if that's returned, that is your accessibility label. So here I'm just taking the accessibility label of content description and renaming the key as accessibility label. So in the future, after I run my test or when it's running, I know what's accessibility label and what is not. So let's go ahead and now use this new class. So here I've already imported it. Um, right now it's going to, I, there's an option to put in an array of locators I don't want. So this is perfect if I don't want to click a, a certain, certain locator. I have a way to exclude if it ever finds it while it's finding parsing. So now I return an array of all my objects, and these are the same objects that are on the compressed hierarchy view. Have all the attributes, if it's clickable, is it focused, is it enabled, it's text, it's class, and so forth. So now this example here is showing you, I'm taking that array and I'm finding the click, a clickable object inside of it. And then I'm just sampling it, which is finding a random clickable object. And now I'm going to interact and click this object. So now you can see I have the object there. And it should click it now. So that's the start. So that block of code that you saw me just paste in, now I'm going to put it into a loop, which is the basic premise of a, of a crawl. So this is just doing a 10 times do loop, which is an easy Ruby block to essentially iterate 10 times through a block of code. And now it's just going to find each object as it goes through each page and click, click it. And it's done. So that is basically crawling at the simplest form. But the hard part. So when you are trying to call an application, you know, you, when you write in UI automation, you know the conditions usually. You know what's going to come up. So you write in conditions, if statements. But you don't know this when you're calling. <clears throat> so there are so many edge cases or unknown conditionals that could occur, especially if you're trying to write this to automate or crawl through any application. Um, that's also difficult. It's a lot easier to create a crawler knowing the application you're going to crawl because you can write in all kinds of methods to deal with certain things about your application, but it's also more difficult to do it for the crawl any application. You know, how do I rescue the app if it gets stuck? So as you saw the crawler as it's going step by step, it could potentially get to a, a page that there are no elements and there's nothing for it to interact with. So you have to put in some logic to rescue it, you know, basically put it back to a state where it could start crawling again. You also have to know when a crash occurs, because crawling, you're running multiple threads or multiple processes. If, a, if your application crashes, then potentially you're starting to crawl the you know, dashboard of the, of the Android uh, UI. Hybrid web views. So a lot of applications these days have web views built inside the native application. So if you go into one of these web views and start clicking uh, different objects in the web view, before you know it, you could be crawling the entire internet. So you have to you know, put in some type of logic to handle when these cases occur. And then exiting the app by mistake. So a lot of applications have authentication. You might click the logout button, or you might click the back button too many times, or the crawler might click the back button too many times. Puts the application out onto the home screen of the Android app. Um, so you have to have logic to basically handle that. And as you saw when I was showing you the, there was an exclude array, you can put in the locators to, of, in this array to not even display it when you get the, or get the hierarchy of the page source. And essentially, this is the plan I just talked about. So let's crawl. This is just an example of one of the many applications I've crawled. It's uh, WordPress, uh, testing both landscape and portrait. 
Um, hence the name, it crawls, it is a bit slow, but there's a lot happening. There's a lot, it's clicking on the metadata, it's clicking screenshots, performance data, and so forth. So, it's looking for changes that occur before it moves on. So now we've crawled, the great thing about it is now I have all my screenshots in all the different languages, different operating systems, landscape or portrait, and now I can review these, this information, find out if there's any bugs. So like I said at the beginning, where I was just trying to clone myself to go out and try to test as much as possible, I can now see what my application looks like in these different combinations. So here that keyboard was opened up so much that there was only a sliver. Um, these are things I could go to development to talk about um, to get fixed, hopefully. Here's my application in, uh, in a, a tablet. So because the application installs on both phones and tablets, it's probably best that you maybe have a tablet version of the application instead of both a phone and a, you know, a combined application. So you can see a lot of the images are stretched, whereas they had a more dedicated design for a tablet, it'd probably look a lot nicer. Uh, this next uh, example is just gonna go into uh, Arabic. So I mentioned before, so Arabic is from right to left, and Western languages are left to right. So this, you know, seeing this, even though I don't speak Arabic, I know enough to, you know, identify there's some problems probably. Like most likely there's English showing up when it should be Arabic. Or some of the UI flows are from left to right, like the bottom left where it should be on the right side from right to left. And because I could page the source, I get the content description. I know what has an accessible label and what doesn't. And I know which views, I, I map each view to their screenshots, so I could identify the objects that have them. And this just raises a good point because now I could go to the product person or developer or whoever it is that needs to know this and have a discussion with them about, you know, the UI on the right has almost every object on it has a label identified by the red dot. But on the left, only a few do. So our seeing impaired users that need to have the apps be more accessible, um, maybe we need that more. Um, so this, this is good information to know. So you could approach your, um, make your application better. Now you have application performance. So it's not enough to just test your application. You could have the best design, best looking application in the world. It could function perfect and so forth, but if the performance stinks, nobody's gonna use it. And so a lot of people, I think, tend to forget about performance testing when it is just as important as functional testing. And the good thing about, or what you should do with also with uh, performance testing is benchmarking. Since if you could capture the benchmark of your UI flows, then you can put this in some type of graph and keep a track of it. So you know if your performance starts to increase or decrease or if it gets better. This is just information that's good to have. So the crawler, as it crawls through each UI, it collects the performance. So here it's getting that memory, the app CPU, and the user and system uh, resources. And it's also capturing the, the size of the APK file. And why is that important? That's important because um, the app stores have hard limits on how large an application it could be to be uploaded. Or also the, the size what it could be to download uh, over the air uh, through cellular. So keeping track of application size, you'll know if it's starting to creep up or decrease. And now having that information, you can then uh, approach the developer and talk about you know, removing some content out of the application that's not needed anymore to help reduce the size. So we go ahead and watch this run. And since I have all the screenshots, I could actually map the screenshots to every data point that I collect this information so now I know exactly where the application was when this performance spike hit or dropped, and I could actually go into the UI and try to re reproduce it. So again, just having this information for benchmarking purposes is important, so um, you can keep track of it and make sure your application isn't starting to degrade. So language detection. So I was 
you know, scanning all those generated screenshots, uh, finding any spelling mistakes or abnormalities. It's, it's quite consuming. You know, it's helped. It's helped me, you know, expanding, you know, cloning myself. But it takes still it takes a lot of time and also prone to human mistake. You know, I could easily miss a spelling mistake or even if it's a language I don't you know, know. I won't know if it is a spelling mistake or even the wrong language in some cases, because some languages look very similar. So I thought there had to be a better way of automating this part. Well, it just happened, since I have all the, the page source, I, ha I have all the objects, I have all the strings, I know the UI that it's on, I could take that information and then run it through Google Translate to then create a report. So this application was in Spanish, and there's literally only two Spanish words on this flow, and everything else is English. So because I could use Google Translate to actually detect these strings, it could come back and tell me whether you know, anything that wasn't Spanish and report it back to me. So now I don't have to rely on myself or find somebody that knows these languages. I can use a machine to do it. Oh, and there are other alternatives. I use Google Translate because it gave the best results, but um, at the time I was using a bunch of known modules, so there's a ton of open source translating libraries, but they only work if you pass in like three or four uh, words like in, in a sentence. They work well then, do not work well with one word. Um, they don't give you back enough assurance for one word, which most applications like titles and stuff like that are one word. So log monitoring, just as if you, I tell everybody, if you're manually testing an application or exploratory testing or whatever you're doing, or even with automation, UI automation, you should always capture the logs. You should always tail the logs, look at the logs as you're testing, um, because so many issues go unnoticed while you are testing. Could be API issues, there could actually be exceptions, they just don't render on the front end. And so the same applies when you crawl. So because I'm actually monitoring the logs, I could pick up exceptions or crashes, and then I can handle them appropriately. So this application specifically has a button to force it to crash. So now it's gonna click this uh, crash button, detect that there is an exception thrown, and then shut everything down. So this is great, because not only do I have all the screenshots, I have all the steps that it did to get to that point, I now also have an exception. And now with all this information, the metadata, I can send this to development to fix it. But we want to also replay a crawl occasionally because I ran into an exception there. Maybe I want to replay the last steps to see if I can reproduce it. And this is also important if like, it is an actual issue, the developer might fix it and I can replay exactly what I did or what the crawler did to for you know test if the fix happened, it, it actually works. And so here it's going to um, go and uh, replay the exact same steps before. You saw just the tail end of it. This is going to do every step, but it will it, be pretty quick. So it's just going through every, basically doing everything that it did before up until the crash. In this case, it's going to just. It's going to crash again because I didn't fix the app, but in theory, if the developer did fix it, it would then uh, not crash. So again, this is sort of like exploratory testing or like I went through and, oh, I found a crash or reported a bug and now I have to reproduce those steps. So automatic tests. Again, reviewing all the screenshots, every single language, every resolution, orientation, uh, again, became very cumbersome. Again, prone to human mistake. Us as humans, we're not made to do visual detections. You know, We might think we are, but we're really not. We're not made for it. Machines are much better at doing this than we are. So I thought, how could I automate this piece of the process more efficient? And since I work for the company, it, it only made sense. So now I could actually, in theory, I could create a baseline in every combination that we've talked about. Every language, every orientation, every resolution, 
and I could have a baseline for that. So I don't have to review these images anymore as I have been doing. A machine can do it for me. And now if I capture these baselines and I run it again and there's issues that are detected by Apple tools, I only have to review the ones that are broken and not the thousands that are potentially generated. So here's a basic example, something that I created a configuration to create, um, uh, create an example of uh, running the Apple Tools test. In this particular case, I'm identifying when I'm on this activity and this ID is displayed and this text is shown, take a snapshot. Well, and actually, so I have six tests here, so it works whenever I run it it actually identifies and captures the baselines based off of um, the test that I generated. But now I want to test that it's broken, so I actually updated the application, ran the test again, and the crawler automatically detected that the UI, something broke. So now I don't have to actually do anything, it just goes and runs and detects any change occur. However, something was still missing you know, it started saying I wanted to build a crawler that was self-efficient, basically could run and just do its thing. And I wanted to, again, get away from writing tests like I started. You know, I didn't want to be that sad, sad person anymore. And then, you know, as you saw, I was explicitly writing a test, you know, went on this view on this ID shown. If I had hundreds of those, I'd have to refactor those if anything ever changed in my application. So to get away from that, I had to absolutely know more about the application to be more deterministic. So there is actually an awesome tool called APK tool. And with this tool, I could actually decompile my application, extract the layout, the views, essentially, of my application. And then whenever I'm running and getting the DOM of, or not the DOM, the page source of my application, I can match it to the layouts that I've, I've ever extracted. So here's a general just diagram of uh, Android layout. It's similar to the hierarchy that we saw in the hierarchy viewer. And now using APK tool, I could extract all the different layouts, which are returned as XML files, which I can then parse and then match my uh, page source with the layouts returned. And so now I have the hierarchy view, which maps to my layouts that I've extracted, which then now I have a deterministic way to know exactly if I'm on the login view, homepage, whatever view of my application is. And this will actually be a test for me. And when I run Apple Tools again, it actually will detect that, oh, you're on this layout based off of the page source that's returning, which then will produce a test, which then whenever I run the test in the future, it will be the same, same page and same uh, so it automatically will test itself at this point without me having to write a line of code. So this is probably the perhaps the funnest part that I had creating the crawler. I think um, there's not enough emphasis in monkey testing. I think monkey testing frameworks are great. I think they un uncover a lot of issues. I think we should use them more. Just it's, it's part of our tool belt. And this kind of brings me back to being a tester again, building this, because I like to break things. And that's what the Chaos Monkey does. So Android has this built in as their own, but I've replicated the same thing uh, with, using AppNum, or tried to at least. So on the left is Snapchat, on the right is Twitter, and in the middle is just some random console uh, output that's basically, on the, you know, it's just doing random swipes up and down, random taps, uh, clicks. Here it's about to tweet Best Buy this uh, cute little kitten gif. I think it was almost close, but it never quite did it. Um, here you can see on the left it's just randomly tapping. It's, it's doing all kinds of um, different interactions. And this is good because this actually will stress test my application. This will bring my application to, you know, hopefully to its limits. And, you know, because we don't know what our users are going to do. Our user, we have crazy users out there. And they could just do what this is doing to our applications, which, you know, if we're using um, some type of reporting tools or getting like analytics back, we might see these crashes and we have no idea why they're happening. So you can see here it's just doing random top, 
taps, slash, swipes, um, up and down, and so forth. So how about scaling? It's, you know, as so far you've seen me run it all locally. You know, depending on the resources of your machine, you can, you know, run multiple Android emulators or device, real devices, whatever you have access to, or multiple sh machines. But like really, it comes down to, um, you know, resources. You know, so you could do this locally. If you had to do it on the, all those combinations, it might take a while to do. Or you could run on, on a uh, cloud service. In this case, the crawler can run on Sauce Labs. But again, you are, you're, you are uh, resource constrained because it's still, it's a remote process. You're still running it from your machine, so there is some CPU and memory and everything involved in how many processes and threads that your machine could actually execute. I think the, the good, the, the sweet spot is actually containers. So I, the, there was an awesome talk last year at the Appian conference, uh, the Android doc, Docker um, repository. I actually took that and put the crawler inside of it. <clears throat> so in theory, I can now spawn one to a thousand different containers of all different combinations, all languages, uh, portrait landscape, capturing screenshots, and all this going into Apple tools if I choose. And I have baselines now that I could now clone myself a thousand times, potentially. So some funny moments why I'm building this. So when you first create an application, or a Twitter account, you um, don't have anybody, you know, you're not following anybody, so your feed would be blank. But what Twitter does is they geolocate you and they uh, feed your feed based off of people around you. And lucky for me, uh, the police department was in my feed. And uh, so I, I set the crawler off to go and tweet or do what it, do its thing with Twitter. And I come back and I was like, oh, oh, cool, it looked like it tweeted. And come find out it tweeted the police department. So I quickly uh, stopped it and deleted the tweet. Um, and also, I don't know if you noticed some of the text that it prints out. I use this uh, gem or library called Faker, and it has a, uh, a class in it does, that does hipster text. So it's a bunch of random stuff. Oh, and then just recently, as I was preparing for this talk, I ran it on Twitter again. And lately, there's this like Twitter feud or something going on between Justin Bieber and Tom Cruise, one in the fight in the octagon. So I ran the Twitter, <laughs> ran the tweet, uh, or the bot on that, and it be became obsessed with tweeting and liking all the uh, Justin Bieber and uh, Tom Cruise tweets. And you saw my examples with WordPress. I, I made the mistake of using my personal account. So as the as the uh, crawler was going through every account and um, going to these blogs and then clicking on the comment section, putting in all the hipster texts, I had a bunch of people email me and ask me what was wrong with me. So, so uh, word of advice: don't use your personal accounts when you do this. So conclusion. Uh, hopefully, I've shown you there are benefits to you know, creating these crawlers, help you find more information or about your application, and just help us leverage more, more machines. Uh, you know, I built this. The whole purpose wasn't to replace you and I as humans or even UI automation. There, there are purposes and there's places for those, but really, it's just adding another tool to our tool belt to help find more issues in such the sh such fast-paced environment we are in now. And so I built this because I thought it should exist. I believed it should exist. And hopefully I've inspired some of you to create your own. Or, you know, I'd love help too. So if you guys want to help me make this better, um, I would appreciate it. And so here are some helpful resources based off of some of the things I've talked about. Uh, the page source uh, parser example is just a small breakdown of uh, getting, uh, parsing the page source and getting the objects. Uh, APK tool, which showed you, I showed you um, to decompile an application. Uh, again, the Docker Android, awesome uh, repository for easily putting your application into containers. And then the app and crawler. So everything that you 
most of everything you would say just seen um, is out there now in version one. Some things I will be introducing for version two uh, when I get time to work on it. And then again, I'm looking for any help, volunteers. I definitely would appreci uh, appreciate any help. And thank you. Any questions? I have some shiny pens, two shiny pens in case anybody wants them. These are uh, Apple Tools pens with stylus. Hello, so this is Jagannath. So how do you make sure app has scrolled all the screens? I mean, you have, you have captured all the screens of the application. How do you make sure that? Oh, how do I make sure it goes through every screen? And it ca captured all the options. Uh, like if I, if we have context menus, so we'll get all the context menus, and we 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 see the difference if we select any of the item and press the context menu again. Yeah. So uh, what the crawler does is actually, as you saw, the simple loop as it's going through the interaction. It, We'll click an object, it will then detect if there's any changes from before to what it is now, capture a snapshot. I also collect you know, the activity that it's on, because uh, at the beginning when the crawler first runs, it actually captures all the activities of the view, so it knows every activity that exists. Um, I also know every layout that exists. So there's several different options that the that crawler does. So one I told you it, it detects a change, it goes on, it looks for a new activity, if it's same activity, it doesn't check it off. Um, but right now, the crawler, there's there's two things that kill it. One is a time limit. You know, I get, let it run for five minutes, 10 minutes. The second is if an exception occurs. Um, right now, I do plan to eventually put it, you know, because because I can run it in multiple processes or uh, containers, I could have it all contacting the central repository or central database and saying, oh, I've already been on this view, go on to the next view. So you could, in theory, capture every type of view on your application and then shut everything down. So in some cases, we need to log in, and uh, some input may need valid text. So how right. do you do that? Uh, yeah, so there is a configuration file. If you go to the repository that I put on the, re on, the on here, at the very bottom, the AppM crawler um, link, there's a whole readme that tells you what, you what you need to do. But there is a small configuration file that you need, if you need to log in, you could set the login steps. So the logger, the crawler will detect that you're on the login view. Go ahead, log in, and then continue the crawl. Okay, thank you. So, yep, no problem. Uh, since you implemented this with Appium, I was wondering how difficult. You mentioned some Android-specific things, but in general, would this work on let's say UI TV, desktop, iOS, Mac apps, et cetera, like what are the barriers towards doing this? Yeah, so that's also why I implemented with Appium because it's cross-platform. So in theory, I could take this and I wouldn't say easily, but do it for iOS and um, uh, WinApp driver for um, desktop Windows applications. So there are lots of possibilities. I, I have it on the roadmap to eventually do for iOS. I mean, Android alone, just doing this was a ton of work and a lot of effort, and I sort of was burned out from it. I, was, I didn't even want to dig into iOS yet, but especially now that you can run multiple simulators, um, when I started this, that didn't exist. So having that actually would make it better and a more powerful tool for iOS, I believe. So one last question. So I have a question regarding language localization, which you uh, have shown for uh, Arabic. So we do work on Arabic and Hebrew stuff. So uh, whenever we have a decision to make, the decision itself is in the uh, opposite direction. So is there any intelligence built in which actually tells you whether to cancel a pop-up or uh, go in a different direction? Because language localization, when you do, so you have to uh, handle things intelligently. Because it's not English, it goes in the wrong direction. And how do you ensure, when you are using Google Translate, whether the translation is uh, perfect? Yeah, good question. So because the, because the crawler is getting just the objects from the page source, it doesn't, it doesn't know, it doesn't care what language it is. It doesn't care if it's left or right. It's just going to click, click either yes or no. On the yeah, button. for the same so, reason. Like if yeah. it does keep accepting the same, so I'm saying not for a crawler, 
for uh, for intelligent uh, uh, for flow i'm saying uh, if it is in hebrew and you are uh, clicking it's it's a random click crawler is a random click yep. but but when you are actually testing and you have actually the elements with you the elements are in english because obviously elements are in english but uh, your language is basically in either in hebrew or arabic so how do you ensure like the flow which is going is perfect like you keep cancelling something or you keep accepting something those kind of things right i mean there's no because it's undeterministic at some point because it's just going to click randomly mm -hmm. there's no way to ensure that it's going to be perfect um that's what ui automation is for explicitly writing a j unit test or whatever sure. so, um but to answer your question about real quick about the translation is because i put the application in um, like say um, spanish i tell google translate that I'm looking for Spanish strings, and then it will return me back. It's essentially going to return me back everything, telling me if it's Spanish, French, whatever. And I extract only the strings that don't come back as Spanish. And then I know those don't match. So, great. Thank you.